Welcome to The Night Tube. I'm Stephen Knight and I'm very pleased to be joined by writer and social commentator Toby Young. Toby, how are you doing? I'm good, Stephen. How are you? Yeah, wonderful. Bit hot, but, uh, you know, surviving. Can't complain. Uh, that's the weather chat done. Um, so before we jump into the big topics, I'm really looking forward to speaking to you about the um, the free speech union, uh, cancel culture, uh, the, the state of discussion in general. Um, but maybe you could tell me a little bit about yourself. How would you describe what you do now when somebody asks you what is it that takes up the bulk of your time? Um, it partly depends on who I'm talking to. So um, if it's a matter related to the free speech union, I describe myself as the general secretary of the FSU. Um, if it's something, um, you know, about contemporary politics, then I'm an associate editor of The Spectator. Uh, it's usually one of those two. Right. OK. I mean, I think the first time I ever saw the phrase outrage archaeology was in one of your Spectator pieces. Is that something you coined? Offence archaeology. Offence archaeology. OK. So no. let, that's not yours. I- not mine. No. See, I've been passing this on because somebody praised me for it a while back, and I said, "No, that's Toby Young." So you're getting you're getting credit happy, for it. Happy to, yeah, I'm happy to take credit, but it wasn't me. Okay, well, maybe that's a good place to start because you're somebody who's been right in the thick of that sort of thing a while back, and this is well documented, and we don't have to go into the specifics again. But people were digging up tweets and past things that you'd written. Uh, a lot of it misrepresented. A lot of it you admitted yourself. It's you know, it's not the opinions you hold now. I think you, you I think you uh, refer to it as something sophomoric. Um, so what, what's that experience like when the online mob comes for you over opinions that you shared several years ago? Yeah, in my case, it wasn't, um, it wasn't that um, opinions I had held were dragged up and held against me so much. Um, it, there was a bit of that, but um, the um, more damaging material was um, uh, sort of controversial phrases I'd used and um, you know, deliberately provocative things I'd said, both in my journalism and on Twitter. And the sophomoric stuff was tweeting about, you know, celebrities' boobs um, and making stupid jokes during kind of Red Nose Day in 2009. Um, someone dredged up an essay I'd written for a book called The Oxford Myth, edited by Boris Johnson's sister, which was published in 1987. Um, uh, so that was um, 31 years before. Um, uh, uh, my appointment to the Office for Students, which is what triggered this kind of um, crowdsourced offence archaeology. Um, but it, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't opinions, really. It was more um, particular words hmm. and phrases which were deemed to be um, uh, inflammatory and offensive. Do you think, as a society, then, in terms of jokes and maybe pure rail jokes, we've become a, a bit more conservative in that sense? We expect our public figures to com- be to be completely squeaky clean, and I just wonder how younger people trying to navigate this arena now are going to fare, knowing that every moment of their life from inception now is going to be documented digitally. I mean, what advice could you give to somebody who's younger who's just starting out in uh, in social media and things like that? My advice uh, to anyone um, would be, any young person would be to stay off social media, which doesn't um, uh, self-destruct within a 24 hours. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, anything they say on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram um, could easily come back and bite them in the bum if uh, if they're ever appointed to a significant job. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I did actually offer my services to an organization called Speakers for Schools, run by Robert Peston, amongst others, uh, and said, you know, I'll happily go around schools as kind of, you know, exhibit A of what not to do, um, (laughs) uh, because it can destroy your career. And just to, you know, just at at least be cautious. Um, I mean, I think in in, in, one of the difficulties um, people of my age face is that many things that were on the right side of the line um, even as recently as 10 years ago, and now on the wrong side of the line. Um, it's, it, it, we saw this recently with um, the cancellation of um, the Faulty Towers Germans episode, uh, with the cancellation of Little Britain. Um, uh, things which were acceptable are now unacceptable because the line has shifted leftwards. Uh, and if you're a journalist like me, who has built a career on staying just the right side of the line, 
um, that's going to that's going to be that's going to create difficulties for you because the line is constantly shifting leftwards. So even if you kind of uh, like a kind of trapeze artist or a kind of tightrope walker, just stay on the right side, you're going to end up on the wrong side retrospectively. I think the other difficulty is that um, back in the day when I first started using Twitter, 2009, 2010, um, it was a conversation between you and your followers. It was a bit more like WhatsApp than it is today. It wasn't a kind of, uh, wasn't considered the public square, mm. which anything said was effectively uh, being broadcast in public. Um, uh, it was just kind of a conversation. It was banter between, you know, your followers um, and you. And uh, so, of course, you were much more incautious and it was much more like kind of being in a pub uh, and stuff you'd say in a pub, you wouldn't say in the public square. So when the Twitter then sort of stopped being the pub and became the public square, lots of things I'd said sort of in the pub, uh, it was as though I'd said them in the public square. And I think that's a difficulty too. People might treat certain social media forums. I mean, even WhatsApp, I mean, I don't know if you spotted this, but... Um, uh, uh, during the um, height of the coronavirus pandemic, um, WhatsApp groups, uh, if, if you were on a WhatsApp group uh, and you said something um, contentious about the virus, if you challenged COVID orthodoxy, if you, for instance, said that you thought that hydroxychloroquine uh, was an effective treatment, um, uh, you could be, um, your message, you'd be told by, you get a message from WhatsApp saying, we've restricted your message to just one person. Oh, I wasn't yeah. aware of this. So, that, so WhatsApp are literally the, the, the sensed WhatsApp to monitoring people's messages and if you dissent from you know uh, the who's orthodoxy on covid um what you say on whatsapp will be restricted and sometimes content will be removed well maybe that's a good segue into your work under under the guise of lockdown skeptics and this is an area of um uh, discourse, which I, I'm, I'll openly say I'm not particularly well educated in. I don't know much about epidemiology, about viruses, pandemics in general. So my view on this really is to follow the advice of the government, which I have been doing. But I appreciate there are people with alt alternate views. And I've kind of resigned to the idea that we'll only really have a true picture of what has happened and how serious it was when this pandemic is over. Uh, but you, you've actually been more proactive in that sense. And you've challenged a lot of the initial science. You've challenged a lot of the government guidelines. And I just wanted to to try and find out where that line is do you think between challenging uh, something under the guise of skepticism and possibly creating harm given the consequences of being wrong on this issue how do you find that balance yeah um i'll address that in one second but just while i've got this fresh in my head and just as a warning to any people watching this who think that what they say in whatsapp is safe just to give one concrete example, the Free Speech Union is currently trying to help a third year student um, at a major Russell Group University who um, is being put through a very serious disciplinary process, which could end with him being thrown out of the university before he has a chance to take uh, his final degree. Um, uh, and and the, 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 the thought crimes he's uh, accused of are things he said in a WhatsApp group before he became a registered student at the university. Um, uh, so uh, it was a WhatsApp group created for um, uh, students who'd been admitted but hadn't yet become registered students at the university in question. And the idea was it was an opportunity for students doing a particular subject to get to know each other. And uh, it was a WhatsApp group, and this particular student said various incautious things. He's a conservative uh, in this WhatsApp group. And not only are, are, is he being hauled over the coals for having said those things now, three years later. Uh, no, I think, it's, I think it's two years later. Um, but um, he's already been hauled over the coals for them once. Um, so he's, he's already been hauled over the coals. Um, he was effectively exonerated, and now he's being hauled over the coals for them again. Um, I mean, the principles of natural justice uh, don't apply in these kangaroo courts, even in the most prestigious universities in the land. So if anyone thinks that something they say in WhatsApp, in a private WhatsApp group, um, uh, uh, can't come back to bite them in the bum, they're mistaken. Um, particularly, you know, n n not, not, not because WhatsApp are going to kind of report you to the authorities, but because other people in the group may report you to the authorities in due course. I mean, it, it, it is extraordinary how censorious and officious and Big Brother-like the contemporary climate is, but people should be aware 
that anything they say in any public or semi-public forum, even if they think of it as a private group, uh, will and ca can and will be used against them. Not in a court of law, couldn't be used against them in a court of law, but in a kangaroo quasi court in a university or within a company or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll openly say right now, if any of my friends' group WhatsApp messages were leaked, I would never work again. Um, but I mean, so have we lost that line between the private and the public? Then is is everything fair game now in the in the in the world of cancellation culture? Well, uh, it's hard to think um, of anything which could be used against someone uh, whom the mob is trying to cancel that hasn't been used against them. Um, uh, there's another there's another case uh, where I'm trying to help someone at the moment, um, an academic, um, uh, and um, uh, he's being hauled over the coals uh, for liking tweets. Um, uh, you'd think that merely liking a tweet um, uh, wouldn't necessarily be tantamount to expressing the same opinion uh, in the tweet that you're liking, um, but. Um, that line is not a line that's um, observed. That distinction is not a distinction that's observed by these kangaroo courts. And well, even that, by that's interesting them, because you know, the, the like yeah. function for me, I, I often use that as a bookmarking function. I, I actively uh, like tweets with dis opinions that I find quite offensive or disagreeable so that I can talk about them later as a quick reference. So I might want to think about <laughs> uh, having a clear out in that regard. You know, you know, the, you know, the, I mean, I, I think even even um, it not just um, uh, jumped up petty martinets in universities um, are the people you have to worry about, but also the police, obviously. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the Harry Miller case, but Harry Miller's the reason Harry Miller was investigated uh, by Humberside Police um, is because um, he liked a transgendered verse. People sometimes describe it as a limerick. It wasn't a limerick. It was just a verse. It was a comic verse, a satirical verse about transgendered people, not about a particular trans person. Um, and um, a trans person complained about the fact that he had liked this verse, didn't create it, didn't tweet it out, just liked it. Um, and uh, the police took that complaint seriously. Uh, this trans, trans person said that they felt um, uh, you know, endangered by the fact that this other person had had liked this verse, uh, that they investigated him. They came to his place of work. He was put through the mill and they eventually concluded that he wasn't guilty of committing a hate crime, uh, but he had nonetheless committed a, uh, a, a, um, a, a what was it called? Um, it's a hate incident. Uh, a non-crime hate incident. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that's now gone on his record. And um, if he applies for a job as a teacher or a carer and his prospective employer does an enhanced DBS check, um, he probably wouldn't get a job as a teacher or a carer. Um, and he, as you know, um, uh, took to, he, he, he challenged that in the high court. And the judge said, yes, you're right. The police overreached. He compared Humberside police to the Stasi and the Gestapo um, and said that uh, they were um, they shouldn't have investigated him for liking this tweet. But nonetheless, uh, the, the judge said it wasn't unlawful to record the fact that he had committed this non non crime hate incident on his record. Uh, there was nothing unlawful about that. So Harry is appealing that verdict in the hope of getting another uh, getting the Supreme Court. Um, to rule that actually it is unlawful to record that on your record. Um, and it remains to be seen whether he'll be successful. But uh, e it, from the police's point of view, uh, now, even if you like a suspect tweet, um, that is sufficient to trigger an investigation. And I think that I think that I think when people are told that what they've done will be recorded as a non-crime hate incident rather than a hate crime, they are told that if they continue to do it, if they do it repeatedly, uh, then, then it could uh, escalate and become a hate crime. So, had Harry Miller liked half a dozen uh, uh, comic verses about trans people, then he might be guilty of a hate crime. Uh, you, you saw recently that, um, yeah, it, 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 I mean, uh, this guy in Scotland. Uh, this was only last week. Um, uh, I'm sure you followed this, but um, uh, he 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 called his uh, ex girlfriend's new boyfriend, who was Irish, a leprechaun. Yeah. And that was um, that. That was uh, that was that was, he, and he was um, prosecuted and fined. Um, and the sheriff 
who pronounced the verdict, said he was guilty of a racially aggravated incident. Yeah. So merely calling an Irishman a leprechaun. So, you know, pub, you think pub banter uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be taken seriously by the courts, but it is. Um, so, yeah, I think in the current uh, uh, Maoist climate, um, anyone with the wrong opinions has to be incredibly cautious uh, because if they can find a way to get you, even if it's just liking a tweet or saying something under your breath in the pub, they'll get you. Yeah. Well, there's a lot to talk about in that regard, um, it, you know, in relation to the free speech union and what you do. Um, just before we get into that, maybe just circle uh, quickly back around to lockdown skeptics. And I just want to get an idea of how you're balancing this dangerous area where you you could be giving out misinformation that could be detrimental to people's health if you've missed the mark. You, you Obviously, you think the government experts have missed the mark. Uh, so, you know, they'd be guilty of the same thing in that regard. But how are you walking that line between um, conjecture and sound uh, advice on such a consequential issue? So that's a particularly good question because the Free Speech Union... Um, filed papers um, on Tuesday of this week um, as part of um, uh, an attempt to um, judicially review Ofcom's coronavirus guidance. Ofcom's coronavirus guidance was issued on March 23rd, the same day that um, uh, civil liberties that the British people have enjoyed dating back to Magna Carta were suspended by the government. Um, and the coronavirus guidance essentially says it warned broadcasters um, to take extreme caution um, when challenging the advice of public health authorities. Um, and for the reasons you suggested in your question, which is that um, uh, if people are, in, if people are, uh, if people are, if 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 people end up um, mistrusting what they're told to do by the public authorities during a public health emergency, um, that could that could lead to harm. So you know, example might be um, Donald Trump. Uh, 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 he he purportedly said that uh, if you take if you drink bleach, you can um, uh, that, that that's an effective prophylactic against um, coronavirus. Um, he didn't actually say that, but he said sort of something vaguely near it. So that would be an example. Uh, 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 but but the, the the problem the problem with um, a state regulator, and of course this comes up on YouTube and Facebook too, uh, but it's harder to challenge that than it is a state regulator in the courts. Uh, their argument is, you know, we think it's perfectly legitimate to remove content or fine people for disseminating content, um, which could lead to public harm. Um, uh, and uh, uh, YouTube, for instance, removed a video um, in which I made the civil rights case against lockdowns. Uh, and um, it was in the context of a pretty grown up discussion. I was the only non professor in the discussion. And the other person in the video that they removed was um, Michael Levitt, who's the professor of structural biology at Stanford and the joint winner of the 2013 Nobel Prize for Chemistry. Uh, but nonetheless, because we were expressing dissenting views, YouTube removed that content. And YouTube had this policy, which the CEO of YouTube announced on CNN, that if anyone challenged the recommendations of the World Health Organization on in, in a YouTube video, that content would be removed. And it, it was the rationale was it could cause public harm. Now, one of the one of the, um, the, 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 the sort of there are numerous difficulties with that position, that rationale for censorship. One of them is that um, by far the majority of public harm caused during this crisis uh, has not been harm caused by people like me dissenting from the recommendations of the WHO or the UK government. It's been the official advice of the WHO and the UK government. And the WHO advised at the beginning of January, no, mid, mid to late January, that there was uh, no evidence of human to human transmission of the virus. Um, uh, now, um, had, had the WHO not tweeted that, it might well be that the UK government decided uh, uh, to impose port of entry screening back in January. Those countries that did impose, like Taiwan, for instance, didn't believe a word coming out of China, didn't believe a word being uttered by the WHO. Not surprising because the WHO doesn't even reckon Taiwan, to recognize Taiwan because it is so deeply in the pocket of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, so the Taiwan did introduce port of entry screening in January uh, to travelers from China to Taiwan. And as a consequence, 
Taiwan has had one of the lowest uh, death tolls from coronavirus. All those countries that introduced port of entry screening in January, Vietnam, I mean, all of them um, have incredibly, Vietnam has zero deaths from COVID-19, but, but they have incredibly low, you know, uh, single digit, double digit deaths in total from COVID-19 because they introduced port of entry screening for travelers from Wuhan in January because they just ignored the bullshit that the WHO was coming up with. So the WHO, I mean, you know, it initially said face masks, no need to wear them outside um, uh, 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 health settings. Um, in community settings, pointless. Don't give you any protection at all. Now change its mind about that. So how much damage was caused by that initial recommendation? UK government, UK government uh, public advice. On the 25th of February, um, uh, Public Health England uh, published a notice. It's still on the government website uh, saying, um, there's absolutely no danger to people in care homes and care settings in the community from coronavirus. Zero dangerous. They're not going to get it. They're fine. And that was followed up by advice from the head of the NHS, Simon Stevens, to NHS trusts saying, discharge elderly patients uh, uh, as soon as you can. Discharge as many patients as you can because we're going to have this surge of demand for critical care because mm. of COVID-19. Uh, so you need to discharge yeah, any patient who can, we didn't actually say this, but effectively any patient who can walk needs to be discharged. We need to clear the decks because uh, we're going to be facing, the, we don't want the NHS to be overwhelmed by COVID-19 patients. So as we now know, elderly patients were discharged from hospital without first being tested to, to ensure they didn't have COVID-19, sent back into care homes. And that is one of the contributory factors uh, that something like uh, up to 50% of the total COVID-19 fatalities so far in England uh, have occurred in care homes. So the idea that people like me, uh, you know, people at home, uh, speculating about the virus, about treat different treatments for the virus, about the origin of the virus on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube. The idea that they're causing harm and the public needs to be protected from them because they might undermine public confidence in organizations like the WHO or the PHE. It's just complete. It's just total nonsense. And incidentally, it's part of um, a kind of broader trend whereby under the guise of protecting the public from fake news, or being exposed to conspiracy theories, um, uh, social media companies, big tech giants, employ these so-called independent fact checkers who are effectively, give, they, they do the role of content moderation, of human content moderation for companies like Facebook and Twitter and Google. Um, and, and they're, and, and they're you know, 99% of them are left of center. And uh, under the guise of getting rid of conspiracy theories and protecting people from fake news, they more or less, they they sense a vast swathes of right of center content, and this is the this is a, this is this is a kind of the the new enemies of free speech. They they purport to be these custodians of um, the welfare of the public and identify various forms of information which challenges kind of prevailing orthodoxies as potentially harmful, and that's their rationale for removing it. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's shocking and um, it's a real problem. I mean, obviously this is a new virus. So if I'm to be charitable with the government and the WHO, you can make an argument that they're going off the best scientific data at the time, which is potential, which has the potential to change down the line as we learn more about the virus and its consequences and how to deal with it. And I'm just wondering how, uh, and we talked about how um, you know, that's more of a has more of an impact on the issue than you uh, challenging some of this. But I mean, is it possible that some of your information could suffer from the same sort of issues, whereby you're going off what you think's the the latest and best information, and because it's such a fluid situation in that sense, it might turn out to be bad advice as well. Well, um. I mean, are, are you even issuing? Are you even issuing advice, or are you simply challenging the uh, the current advice? No, I, I haven't been issuing advice. I've mainly right. been challenging the, um, uh, the the thrust of lockdown skeptics. This blog I created um, in March um, is that the lockdown itself, the lockdown policy, indiscriminately quarantining entire populations, um, is um, a policy that causes more harm than it prevents. Um, and uh, and I, could, I could talk for hours about why I think that's the case. Um, uh, when I first made that argument, I was in a tiny minority. 
almost no one believed that uh, indiscriminately quarantining whole populations, the healthy as well as the ill, uh, was an ineffective policy likely to lead to more harm than it prevented. Very few people believed that at the very beginning of the pandemic, even though that had never been tried before as a response to a public health emergency, to a pandemic. It had only ever been tried, as far as I know, in Mexico in 2009, uh, and it was abandoned after a few days because hmm. it was uh, having such catastrophic economic and social consequences. Uh, even the WHO in 2019 um, issued a report about what to do if there was another uh, pandemic um, uh, on the same scale as some of the uh, more recent pandemics. Um, and, uh, and it said indiscriminately quarantining whole populations, that's not the way to go. That causes untold economic and social harm, which far outweighs any harm you're likely to prevent by imposing such drastic totalitarian measures. Uh, but the WHO changed its mind. The reason the WHO changed its mind is because China, having initially done very little in response to the coronavirus and having initially kind of denied that it was a problem, no human to human transmission. When the WHO said that, it was echoing the line of the Chinese Communist Party. It then became embarrassed when it became when it got out that it was in fact uh, not a completely harmless virus and could be transmitted to humans. And there was an epidemic in Wuhan and surrounding areas. So in res- so in response, because it was embarrassed about having done very little, the Chinese Communist Party imposed this draconian measure on the citizens of Wuhan and surrounding areas, whereby they effectively imprisoned them in their homes, or if they tested positive for the virus, whether they were symptomatic or not, however mildly they got it, they were imprisoned in these purpose-built hospitals and kept in these hospitals um, uh, until they'd recovered. Um, And uh, uh, China, having, having imposed this incredibly draconian, never tried before, uh, 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 policy, um, was then praised by the WHO for doing so. Uh, they said this was a model response, and this is how countries ought to respond to this pandemic if they wanted to minimise fatalities. So one after another, all these liberal democracies uh, mimicked the behaviour of the Chinese communist re- regime and suspended civil rights, something like a quarter of the world's population's civil rights were suspended, in some cases indefinitely in some countries, like our country, not all those rights have been restored. Um, uh, In our case, for instance, I'm not sure how many people know this, but the right to trial by jury, which was a right first enshrined in Magna Carta, was suspended um, as part of the government's response to the pandemic. Um, uh, 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 So I've been making the case from a very early stage that the lockdowns, uh, the lockdown is a, is a disastrous policy response. Probably the biggest policy error ever committed by a government in peace or war in the history of the world, I think. I mean, that sounds like an exaggeration, uh, but uh, it's harder to think of a, of a policy uh, that's been so widely embraced and which is likely to cause so much harm. Um, and uh, uh, now I'm not in, in such a small minority anymore. Still a minority. Uh, but it's a growing minority, a minority that's growing by the day. In due course, I'm 100% confident a majority of people, the consensus view will become that the lockdown was an absolute disaster um, uh, as, as the economic and public health consequences and the social consequences of the lockdown become more and more apparent, as they will do over the next 12, 24 months. Uh, so uh, uh, that's, the sort, of, that's the, the sort of general position of lockdown sceptics. Um, I think that one of the reasons um, the government, one of the reasons governments across the world, but just to take the UK, one of the reasons the British government uh, uh, was able not only to impose this uh, uh, catastrophic policy on the British people, but then compound their mistakes by doing various things like the one I mentioned earlier, uh, effectively allowing hospitals, more or less encouraging indirectly hospitals to discharge patients with COVID-19 back into care homes. But, you know, countless errors, the whole ventilator program, uh, ludicrous mistake. Putting people on ventilators is more likely to kill them than save them if they've got severe COVID-19. I mean, untold errors. I mean, just a catalogue of catastrophic mistakes. Uh, Suspending cancer screening programs. Um, uh, You know, the implications of that are going to filter through just that measure of saying we're going to suspend uh, cancer treatments which aren't urgent, 
no inpatient care for people recovering from cancer operations, no cancer screening. Um, Carol Sikora, the professor of medicine at Buckingham University, uh, he predicts that over 50,000 people are going to die unnecessarily because of that measure alone over the next few years. And I think he's now um, uh, increased that estimate. Uh, but, you know, an- just one error after another. I mean, just a blundering keystone cops, uh, tin pot dictatorship style of government. I mean, just unbelievable. As a, as a conservative and a Boris enthusiast, I've been shocked by the absolute staggering incompetence of the UK government and its response to this particular crisis. I mean, they, they couldn't have done it. They could, if, they'd been de- if they'd deliberately set out to cause as much economic, social and public health harm as they possibly could, you know, uh, they couldn't have done a better job. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just eye-wateringly shocking. You, uh, um, you sound and, serious. Uh, <laughs> one of the reasons, I think, one of the reasons... The, the government has behaved so poorly and made such a string of catastrophic policy decisions is because there's there hasn't been a proper public debate. It's been inhibited. Uh, people have felt that they, they shouldn't criticise the government because they don't want to risk uh, uh, causing the public harm by undermining public confidence and trust in the advice being issued by the government. They've sort of taken it on faith that the government knows what it's doing, that these scientists that are advising the government on SAGE and in other committees, the chief scientists, the chief medical officer of the United Kingdom, they've taken it on faith that they know what they're doing, uh, that there is something called the science. There is a consensus about what the best policy response to the pandemic is. And they're just, they're, they're acting on that. Uh, it's all complete nonsense. There is no scientific consensus. Science, as you know, is just, you know, uh, it, particularly uh, with a new virus, it's a lot of competing hypotheses, some of which will turn out to be true, the vast majority of which will turn out to be wrong. The modelling done by Imperial College at the beginning of the pandemic was just so flawed as to be unusable. Um, uh, and, uh, but, but, but I think that the reason, the reason, We've, the government has made so many poor decisions is because of the lack of scrutiny. Uh, the opposition parties during a national crisis like this generally side with the government. They know it's politically unpopular to challenge what the government is doing. People think there ought to be a sort of national government style approach um, uh, in which the opposition effectively go along. So who was opposing the government? Who was holding the government to account? Well, journalists are supposed to be doing that job. But because of kind of groupthink, because journalists became sort of uh, cowed into not challenging these big decisions because they didn't want to risk harming the public or or just because, you know, that they, they, they're kind of uh, they, they sort of fall into this natural elitist mindset in which it was kind of the idea of them acting as custodians of the public interest and uh, and just releasing that information they felt it was useful for the public to know but not challenging anything because they didn't want to uh, feel as though they were challenging the government during this point of it. I mean, it, 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 the, the journalism has really let the side down. But one of the contributory factors, not, not a major factor, but a contributory factor has been, I think, this advice issued by Ofcom on March 23rd, counselling its licensees to treat with extreme caution anyone challenging the prevailing orthodoxy um, uh, being disseminated by the government and various public health authorities, including the WHO, cautioning their licensees to be very careful about broadcasting any any information of that nature during this sensitive and um, perilous time. Uh, I think that did inhibit some broadcasters. And when Eamon Holmes, for instance, Eamon Holmes was reprimanded for by Ofcom referencing this guidance. Incidentally, Ofcom issued follow-up guidance on March 27th, effectively strengthening the guidance they'd issued on March 23rd in secret. That guidance was confidential. So they didn't want that to be talked about. They said, yeah, it's effectively saying, we're censors, but where our censorship extends to not letting you tell people that we're acting as censors. They went along with it. The broadcasters went along with it. Um, and uh, Eamon Holmes was was uh, reprimanded uh, by Ofcom uh, on April 20th uh, because of remarks he'd made. This ITV this morning technically was reprimanded because of remarks Eamon Holmes made on this morning in the context of a discussion about whether there was a link between the symptoms of COVID-19 and 5G masks. Um, and... Uh, Uh, He said in the course of this discussion, he thought that that was untrue and stupid. He didn't believe for a second 
that that conspiracy theory was true. But nonetheless, he said, he thought it ought to be discussed in the public square. People ought to be allowed to raise the possibility without being slapped down, he said. Didn't he... Um, uh, uh, didn't he... Oh, well, just to finish this point, Stephen, um, uh, just for saying that, just for saying that this theory deserved an airing in the public square. Effectively, he was making the same argument that Louis Brandeis made in a famous Supreme Court decision in which he said that the best remedy when it came to conspiracy theories wasn't to suppress those theories, but to counter them uh, with evidence and uh, logic and science. Uh, The remedy to bad speech wasn't to suppress that bad speech, but was more better speech. Sunlight yeah. is the best infection. Yeah. Eamon Holmes was effectively making that argument. He didn't quote Louis Brandeis, but that was his argument. And and just for merely making that argument, Ofcom, who takes a different view, which is that people who, who advocate conspiracy theories about COVID, those conspiracy theories should be suppressed and those people should be silenced. The remedy to bad speech isn't more speech, it's to silence those uh, 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 disseminating the conspiracy because that was Os- Ofsted's view because it doesn't take the view of Louis Brandeis because it doesn't believe in free speech to that extent it it, it reprimanded ITV merely because Eamon Holmes uttered these words on his programme so it was very serious in fact about letting broadcasters know that even the mildest challenge to the government line was unacceptable and I think that's a, that's been a contributory factor to why the fourth estate let down the side so badly during this crisis and allowed the government to make a string of catastrophic decisions never uh, on a scale never before seen in Britain's history uh, without really challenging. They'll hold them to account now. Now they're beginning to challenge them. Now that the kind of, you know, uh, I think the kind of, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the spell has been broken. People are beginning to realise that the government has just horribly mishandled the whole crisis. The lockdown probably wasn't necessary. COVID is probably no more serious a disease than a bad bout of seasonal flu. It's just been a catastrophe. People, are, I think that's beginning to dawn on people. And gradually the press will get hold of this and run with it. And they'll torture and pillory the government. And I expect the Conservatives will lose the 2024 general election. But my God, it's taking it's taking them a while to wake up. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm looking forward to the proper accounting being done uh, in retrospect, obviously. I think with that aim and Holmes thing. I mean, I agree that sunlight is the best disinfectant. I don't think you should silence conspiracy theorists. I, I like to know where they are for a start. So I, I fundamentally disagree with the idea of someone like David Icke being banned from YouTube, even though I share zero opinions uh, with that man at all. But I think Eamon Holmes might have gone a little bit further in the sense that he made a burden of proof fallacy. I think he uttered the opinion that you can't prove it's not true. And I think that's where he, he was seen to come onto the side of, well, maybe it's, maybe it's worth considering and I just wanted to get your opinion just so we're clear uh, do you think the idea that 5G might cause coronavirus symptoms is worth entertaining on a sort of a flagship ITV morning news program well he didn't he didn't um he himself didn't entertain it as i say he dismissed it as untrue and silly um i think he he did appeal to the fact that um when it comes to um uh, our scientific understanding of the effects of the virus and the origins of the virus, uh, that is uh, incomplete and constantly evolving. Uh, and so if, if you're going to argue that the um, airing of certain theories about the origins of the virus and what's causing its effects, if you're going to argue that um, uh, anything contrary to the settled scientific consensus should be prohibited, I mean, I'm not even sure I agree with that, but if that is your argument, uh, that's not a very good argument because there is no, there is very little settled scientific consensus. And much of the science uh, around the virus, our initial understanding of the virus, for instance, that it's primarily a respiratory disease, much of that science has now been discredited. Uh, our, our understanding of it is constantly evolving. I mean, in, a part, in part, it's the government's fault for invoking this completely bogus concept of the science, as if there is a settled universal consensus amongst scientists but 5g feels like it feels like i might as well invoke fairies or the loch ness monster or something it feels in that realm of uh conspiracy theory that that realm of conjecture where okay you it's your right to say it and you can propagate this where you like but the idea we should uh say well the scientific consensus is so fluid that maybe that should be part of the discussion seems a little bit uh too far for me 
Well, I think I think um, I think I think everything should be up for discussion. Yeah. Uh, even if there is a settled scientific consensus that's being challenged in the discussion. I mean, that's all the more reason, surely, to allow. I mean, let's suppose let's suppose it is we can say with 100 percent certainty that there is simply no connection. Uh, between the symptoms identified as symptoms of COVID-19 and 5G masks. Let's suppose hypothetically that we can say that. I mean, I think we can say that with something like 97% certainty. Uh, but uh, but let's suppose we can say it with 100% certainty. Just brook no doubt about that. That's not a reason to prevent people from airing that theory in the public square. That's all the more reason to allow them to air it, because then it can be absolutely definitively and conclusively debunked in the public square, what better way to persuade people who are temp- who are inclined to believe that theory, and it, you know, I'm sure that at least 10% of the British public do, uh, or did, uh, what better way to dissuade them of its truth than to, you know, have Andrew Neil interview David Icke uh, for half an hour, hmm. in which Andrew Neil forensically demolishes the argument. Um, it, that's a much better way, surely, of dissuading those people who attempted to believe it than to suppress it. The moment the government suppresses it, people begin to say, oh, hang on a second. The former director of Ofcom now works for Huawei. There's a link there. I mean, conspiracy theorists are, you know, you're, 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 it's grist to their mill. If you start suppressing things, uh, you know, as soon as you start burying stuff, silencing people who try and articulate these theories, that persuades the people tempted to believe them that they must be true. Yeah. Uh, and that there is this kind of, you know, this sinister network who have a vested interest in. I mean, it's, it's all, all the crap about, you know, Bill Gates uh, having a sort of vested interest of some kind in um, vaccinating everybody. You know, uh, I mean, lots of conspiracy theorists have kind of gravitated towards lockdown skeptics. I mean, you have to sort of bat them away. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's all it, it, the best way to, to, to rebut these conspiracy theories is not to suppress them, uh, but to allow them to be aired so they can then be rebutted. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it's, you know, sunlight is the best disinfectant and it's extraordinary. And, and incidentally, that's but that is the view of um of the european court of human rights um and uh, if if god willing uh, the court gives the uh, free speech union uh, permission to judicially review this coronavirus guidance uh, i think we will be able to invoke article 10 of the european convention on human rights um as as uh, in order to have this advice struck down and declared unlawful okay toby have you got 10 minutes to talk about the free speech union as well sure. okay well um yeah I, I derailed us with the uh, talk of uh, coronavirus unfortunately that is a whole can of worms that could that could you could have a four-hour conversation on that easily uh but the, the free speech union is something i'm really interested in i think it's something that we uh, really need at the moment the amount of regular citizens that are, are falling afoul of online hate mobs and uh people losing their jobs for opinions we just had an instance of that today actually which i want to talk about but on the on the website for the free speech union it it, it declares that um free speech is at greater peril now uh, than at any time since world war ii now to a lot of people living in ostensibly a free british society that might read as hyperbole so i just wondering what what ways do you think that free speech is at uh, a significantly higher level of peril than world war ii yeah well when i um made that video um uh it was before uh, this kind of Maoist cultural revolution hmm. we're currently in the throes of, but I still think it was true then, and it's truer now. Um, I think the 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 there are various pieces of evidence you can cite. One I quite like is um, a survey carried out by a couple of academics at the University of Lincoln on behalf of the UCU, um, Britain's largest academic trade union, and what the surveyors did was they. They, they came up with these metrics by which they compared academic free speech in the UK to academic free speech in all the other EU member states. And they, and they, and they surveyed academics um, and they asked them questions like, do you self-censor? Um, uh, do you think that if, you're, uh, if, if you have an unorthodox view, that's likely to inhibit your promotional prospects and so on and so forth? I mean, they, are, they, they extensively surveyed academics across the EU. And they concluded um, that um, uh, academic free speech um, uh, was less protected in the UK than in every other EU member state bar one. 
Uh, so there's, that I thought was 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 quite persuasive evidence um, from a fairly respectable source. Um, I mentioned earlier um, that the police um, uh, investigate people for alleged hate crimes, such as liking a transgendered verse on tw- a, a comic verse about trans people on Twitter, um, and uh, end up concluding that the person in question is just guilty of having committed a non-crime hate incident. Um, uh, The Telegraph, during um, uh, the High Court case involving Harry Miller, FOI'd police forces in England and Wales and asked them, how many non-crime hate incidents have you recorded in the past five years? And the astonishing number was 120,000, which averages, I think, at um, uh, more than 60 a day. So more than 60 people a day are currently being investigated by police in England and Wales, doesn't include Scotland or Northern Ireland, over 60 people a day for doing things like liking transgender comic verses about trans people on Twitter. So that, I think, has a hugely chilling effect on free speech. Um, uh, There's lots of uh, um, there was there was a survey carried out by an arts organisation which uh, was was uh, published in The Times earlier this year. Uh, and um, and they asked people working in the arts, you know, in theatre, for instance, uh, in um, uh, dance companies, um, in museums, art galleries. Um, they asked them, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, they tried to gauge how much free speech there was in those settings. And the conclusions were eye-watering. You know, uh, if you dissent from a very narrow range of woke orthodoxies in the arts, um, you know, your career can be terminated. Um, and articulating, expressing any dissent from this tiny, very narrow Overton window uh, within the arts, which is hard left, um, uh, expressing any dissent at all is career destroying. Hmm. So anyone who, um, uh, you know, is is to the right of Jeremy Corbyn in the arts just has to self-censor, keep completely stum, not express an opinion, um, uh, you know, in the workplace or on social media, which in any way challenges this very narrow, regressive left orthodoxy. And that was last year. Imagine how much worse it is now. Yeah, well, I mean, this is a common thing now. So everyone seems to get their two minutes hate. Uh, So say if I'm somebody who sent an off-colour joke on Twitter and I've run into consequences with my employer, they've let me go uh, and I've been silenced, in what way can the free speech union assist with that? Well, Um, probably the easiest to describe a few examples. So um, we we, we just scored a significant victory um, in a case in the Isle of Man. So um, a presenter on Manx Radio in the Isle of Man called Stu Peters um, uh, was involved in a heated exchange with a caller in a late night phone in show at the beginning of the month. Um, uh, Stu Peters had written a Facebook post um, in which he had questioned the point of a BLM protest in the Isle of Man, <laughs> uh, which was upcoming, uh, saying it, it, it's 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 terrible that George Floyd was murdered in the way he was, um, and I have every sympathy for people protesting about that in Minneapolis. But what is the point of protesting about that in Douglas in the Isle of Man? <laughs> um, and and it's, so this caller was very unhappy that he had expressed this point of view. Uh, and the caller was a person of colour. And they then got into a spat in which the caller, I think, invoked the concept of white privilege. And Stu pushed back and said he wasn't privileged. He'd been born to a fairly uh, impoverished working class family and so forth. And then the caller became so enraged that it sounded as if Stu was denying that he was privileged in virtue of the colour of his skin that he hung up. The following day, the Isle of Man creamery, which was advertising on this late show that Stu Peters presented, pulled its advertising from the show. Um, uh, Manx Radio panicked, suspended Stu Peters and referred him or themselves, I think, effectively, technically, to the Isle of Man's Communications Commission, which is the Isle of Man equivalent of Ofcom. And it then sat down and investigated Stu Peters over a number of weeks. And the free, it, Stu Peters is a member of the Free Speech Union. So um, we, um, uh, we went to bat for him. And what that meant was um, we uh, wrote a stiff letter to the Communications Commission pointing out that 
merely investigating Stu Peters for this uh, could be construed as a breach of his right to freedom of expression under Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, that the Isle of Man was bound by Article 10, uh, that nothing Stu Peters said was a breach of the program code um, that the public broadcasters on the Isle of Man are expected to uphold. And we point pointed out where he hadn't breached the program code and so on and so forth. Nothing he said could be construed as remotely an incitement to racial violence or racial hatred or anything of that nature. It was just a robust exchange of views. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I think you know, we hinted that should the, should, the, should the decision be that he had indeed breached the program code, then that is something we would challenge in the courts in the Isle of Man. Uh, anyway, um, uh, and we also um, uh, encouraged uh, some locals on the Isle of Man to start a change.org petition, and we tried to uh, get as much publicity for Stu Peters' cause as we possibly could. So Rod Little wrote something in The Spectator. There was a piece in the mail on Sunday and so forth. Well, yesterday, um, the um, Communications Commission uh, issued its verdict, which which was more or less a complete exoneration of Stu Peters, uh, and they they you know they, they cited his right to freedom of expression, and they said even though insensitive language was used in the course of this discussion, I think the the main thing they flagged up was that a caller in an earlier conversation on the same program had used the word coloured during a kind of rant, and um, uh, and Stu Peters uh, didn't interrupt and correct this guy for using. A racially insensitive term hmm. in the course of the rant, and Stu Peters' defence was, well, you know, he was ranting. You know, I didn't want to kind of uh, wind him up any further, and you know, risk triggering him in a way which might make him say even more racially insensitive things. So I just, you know, ended the call yeah. and talked to the next caller. I mean, a perfectly legitimate defence. Anyway, uh, so it, they sort of flagged up that some insensitive language was used, but nonetheless, he was merely exercising his right to freedom of expression. So it's actually a pretty good, robust decision. Communications Commission doing its job in a way that Ofcom, I don't think, has been. Uh, so quite a model, actually, of, of, of how a broadcast regulator should be operating. Anyway, so it, it it exonerated him. And I believe that Manx Radio, whom he's meeting with today, are going to give him his job back and he's going to resume uh, doing exactly what he did next week. So really happy about that outcome. And that's an example, I think, of where we can go to bat for our members. But usually it's um, things uh, below the radar. So it's academics being hauled before kangaroo courts for liking the wrong tweets. Um, it's students uh, being hauled before kangaroo courts for things they said in WhatsApp group, the earlier example I mentioned, even before they joined the university. Um, uh, we've gone to bat for um, a cartoonist called uh, Stella Parrott, um, who was effectively uh, terminated with extreme prejudice by uh, the Morning Star after she submitted and they published a gender critical cartoon. They published this gender critical cartoon. Um, it was, I think, a, a, a kind of crocodile about to enter a pond of newts and the crocodile was kind of salivating, clearly about to eat the newts and said, I self-identify as a newt as it was entering the, the pond. And the Morning Star published this, didn't see anything wrong with it. And then, of course, were kind of the, the kind of an outrage mob immediately formed up and uh, started demanding kind of resignations and scalps. And uh, so the editor of uh, the Morning Star immediately threw Stella Perrett under a bus, apologized for publishing the cartoon, made the same bullshit excuse that the New York Times made uh, when it published the op ed by Tom Collins, which triggered all the kind of woke junior staff members, uh, said, Yeah, our editorial processes were defective in this case uh, it wasn't properly reviewed it didn't go through our normal procedures we don't know how this happened we're reviewing those make sure nothing like that happens again all nonsense they just didn't have a clue that it was going to trigger all their woke readers but it did anyway this poor woman Stella Perrett has, has now kind of she lost her job at a trade union as a result of being kind of publicly defenestrated in this way um, and she's been you know giving her, her cartoons for, for free for countless years to the Morning Star I mean it's just appalling anyway we've written we've written we've written a stiff letter to the editor of the morning star ben chaco about that and he's replied making some conciliatory noises and stella seemed happy with that outcome um we're involved i mean it, it, at the moment we are being deluged on a daily basis uh, with requests to help from people who are at risk of being cancelled or who have been cancelled and um where we can we help you know we've got a legal advisory council um, about a dozen lawyers, most of them barristers, willing to go to bat for our members and other people on a pro bono basis. We don't, you know, we can't guarantee 
that we can provide you with pro bono legal support, but in some cases we can and we have been. Um, we've got now over 4,000 members, over 3,000 supporters, so we can in certain circumstances mobilize them to go to bat for people if they're being mobbed on social media. Um, uh, we've got a research arm, um, so we're publishing various papers, proposing how existing legal protections for free speech can be strengthened, how the law can be changed, examining. We're about to commission something on the role of these independent fact checkers working for companies like Facebook and Twitter and how um, uh, uh, how they are the kind of cutting edge of contemporary censorship and responsible for removing vast swathes of right of center content across these social media platforms, not just right of center content, but for the most part. Um, uh, we've also got an education arm. So when we're allowed out of our homes again, um, we'll be organizing speakeasies, debates, um, we'll be touring universities and six forms trying to uh, 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 persuade younger people that free speech is important. As you know, one of the kind of um, reasons younger people have been persuaded that free speech isn't important is because they think that free speech is at odds with the rights and interests of historically disadvantaged groups, mm. that it's only something that benefits, you know, white, heterosexual, middle-aged men like me. Um, but actually, historically, it's perfectly easy to show that um, First Amendment protections in the US, for instance, were absolutely instrumental in enabling civil rights protesters to organize, march, protest. Uh, and if you look at the history of civil rights victories won, starting with the suffragettes, if it wasn't for free speech, none of those victories would have been possible. So actually, free speech is the friend of historically disadvantaged groups, not their enemy. And that's a lesson I think that really needs to be um, conveyed to younger people who've been brainwashed into thinking that free speech is just something that uh, benefits a tiny percentage of privileged males. Yeah, I mean, I know it's it's said often, or it has been said often, but probably not often enough anymore. But obviously, free speech is the bedrock from which all of the rights originate from. Um, so yeah, I mean, if we want to get a grip on this stifling woke culture, we do need some form of pushback. And normally, I'd be against any sort of official action in that sense. But if the game's been rigged so heavily on one side of the debate, uh, it obviously seems that we all need to take a, a greater interest in our individual rights. So I'm, I'm glad the Free Speech Union uh, is taking up that cause. I will, I will consider becoming a member. I'll have a full read over the uh, the mission statement later on today. Uh, but Toby, I pretty much ticked off everything I wanted to get uh, in on this conversation. Uh, before I let you get back to your what's left of your morning, uh, is there anything you'd like to point people towards or, or say before I let you go? Well, just to just to go back to what we were talking about earlier and to try and sum up, um, you invoked the concept of potential harm to the public as perhaps a legitimate reason for restricting speech. Um, I think that, um, I think, you know, I am a believer in Mill's harm principle. And I think under certain circumstances, um, uh, it is legitimate to restrict speech if you can show uh, that, 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 that allowing the person to speak is going to cause direct and immediate harm. But the threshold needs to be very high. It can't be potential harm. It can't be psychological harm. Um, you know, people who argue that speech is violent, all the people on Twitter um, who uh, mobbed J.K. Rowling uh, claimed that uh, by, by, by saying that there was another word for people who menstruate, and that word is woman, um, uh, by saying that, that she was effectively committing violence against trans people, um, they're, they're massively expanding the concept of harm in order to invoke Mill's harm principle to restrict speech. I think it's le legitimate to invoke the harm principle, but you have to have a very narrow and very carefully defined concept of harm. And the problem with the Ofsted uh, uh, coronavirus guidance and the problem with the manner in which these independent fact checkers go about their business is that they have this capacious, nebulous definition of harm under which almost anything can be classified as harmful, quote unquote. And that gives them the license, all the license they need uh, to act as censors. Uh, so I think one of the kind of big battles is making sure that we stick to a very narrow, very concrete, very carefully defined concept of harm if we're going to invoke that 
to restrict speech. It's much, much more concrete and much narrower, much more carefully defined in the law, uh, not, not carefully defined enough. And of course, there is a, 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 a hate crime bill currently before the Scottish Parliament, which will, uh, if, it, if it passes, mean that Scotland uh, is the least free speech friendly country in Europe, including Hungary. And the Free Speech Union has submitted some evidence to the Scottish Parliament's Justice Committee saying why we think this bill needs to be heavily amended or withdrawn. Otherwise, its consequences for free speech in Scotland will be absolutely catastrophic. Um, uh, but um, uh, the law generally is much better. Um, at defining harm. Um, the problem is that in these kangaroo courts that people are subjected to hauled before for wrong thing, in companies, in universities, in schools, um, uh, the concept of harm is typically nebulous, capacious, and it's not difficult um, given, the, given the lack of definition for these kangaroo courts to conclude that the people who've liked inappropriate things on Twitter have actually caused harm, that that is a species of violence and that they have no place in the workplace. They've created a hostile work environment. They've made their colleagues feel unsafe. They've harmed them in that sense. Uh, uh, they've triggered them. They're guilty of microaggressions, mm. all these ludicrous kind of extended uh, amorphous definitions of harm, but they can be invoked in these kangaroo courts. And so, you know, there's, there's a lot of work for the free speech union to do. Excellent. Well, I'll be, uh, sure to share the link in the video description so people can go and check that out and consider becoming a member uh, but Toby thank you very much for speaking to me that's been uh, really informative thanks David good to talk to you too